is the largest amphitheater ever built and is considered one of the greatest work of architecture and engineering. The Colosseum construction began under the Emperor Vespasian in 72 AD and was completed in 80 AD under Titus. This area was um, densely inhabited. So many, many people lived here um, around um, 0 AD, so to say. It was uh, devastated by the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD. You probably know the story about the fire and that Christians have been blamed uh, because of the fire. So Nero who was the emperor at that time, added much of the, of the area to his personal domain. He built the grandiose Domus area, a large landscape villa on the side in front of which he created an artificial lake surrounded by pavilions and gardens. So that was a huge area, a huge park just for Nero's amusement. The existing Aqua Claudia Aqueduct was extended to supply water to the area and the gigantic bronze colossus of Nero was set up nearby at the entrance of the Domus Aurea. So that was the original plan of that place before the Colosseum was set. After Nero's death, the Golden House, as it was called, was a severe embarrassment to his successors. So it was stripped of its marble, its jewels, and its ivory within a decade. Soon after Nero's death, the palace and grounds were filled with earth and built over. <coughs> Only the Colossus, so the Nero statue, was preserved. The land was reused as a location for the new Colosseum, also known as the Flavian Amphitheater, under the Emperor Vespasian, 72 AD, as I said earlier. Gladiatorial schools and other supporting 
support buildings were constructed nearby within the former grounds of the Domus area. Vespasian's decision to build the Colosseum on the side of Nero's Lake can be seen as a populist gesture to returning, uh, of returning to the people and area of the city which Nero had uh, appropriated for his own use. In contrast to many other amphitheaters, which were located on the outskirts of a city, the Colosseum was constructed in the city center, in effect placing it both symbolically and precisely at the heart of Rome. The construction was completed in 80 AD under Titus. Construction was funded by the opulent spoils taken from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem after the great Jewish revolt in 70 AD. So that was financed by the treasure of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Estimated 100,000 Jewish prisoners were brought back to Rome after the war and many contributed to the massive workforce needed for the construction. The slaves undertook ma uh, manual labor such as transporting the quarried stones 20 miles from Tivoli to Rome. Yeah. You can imagine how many stones they had to carry to build that construction. 20 miles. And these massive stones. The Colosseum could hold between 50 and 80,000 spectators. Maximum 80,000. There are not many fo football stadiums in the world that can hold 80,000. Borussia Dortmund. Borussia Dortmund. So having <laughs> having an average audience of some uh, 65,000. It was used for gladiator gladiatorial contests and public spectacles such as mock sea battles, animal hunts, executions, reenactments of famous battles and dramas based on classical mythology. Although partially ruined because of damage caused by earthquakes and stone robbers, the Colosseum is still an iconic symbol of Imperial Rome and one of Rome's most popular tourist attractions, as we already could experience uh, <laughs> waiting here, and <laughs> waiting, and more waiting. <laughs> um, if you're looking for a souvenir, no. just look for the Italian version of the five cent euro coin, because the Colosseum is depicted on this coin. So that will be the cheapest <laughs> how, how much it cost? <laughs> 20. I'll give you a special price, just 50 cents. <laughs> I have a lot. The Colosseum has been a site of the matter dome of large numbers of believers during the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. The most popular type of that kind of show was the animal hunt or Venatio. Uh, on purpose, I brought a picture wow. so, uh, for the kids to see how that looked like. So, like so you see how the Colosseum looked when it was um, in best shape. And here you see the Christians, some are crucified, some were burned, and the others were expecting the lions and tigers to go get them. So you can give that around, just have a closer look. <laughs> this utilized a great variety of wild beasts, mainly imported from Africa and the Middle East, and included creatures such as rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, elephants, gir giraffes, our ox, bisons, lions, panthers, leopards, bears, tigers, crocodiles, and ostriches. Such events were occasionally on a huge scale, and if I say huge, I mean huge. Trajan is said to have celebrated his victories in uh, Dacia in uh, 107 with contests involving 11,000 animals and 10,000 gladiators over the course of 123 days. 
During lunch intervals, executions at bestias would be staged. Those condemned to death would be sent into the arena, naked and unarmed, to face the beast of death, which would literally tear them to pieces. At this place, where we are standing, actually not, we're standing not down there, we're standing a little up here. Better than um, <laughs> Um, masses of Christians were persecuted for standing strong in their faith. They knew what would happen if the Romans would figure out that they believed in Jesus Christ. Their crime was to refuse um, to rever uh, the reverence to the Roman gods and proclaim Jesus Christ as the son of the only God and creator of heaven and earth. Christians were expected to take part in rituals and sacrifices to the pagan gods and goddesses of the Romans. Therefore, many Christians went into hiding. Converting to Christianity during this period was highly dangerous because of persecution. Statues or idols of gods and goddesses were erected at the corners of the streets, in the marketplaces, and over the public fountains, making it impossible for a Christian to go out without being put to the test of offering sacrifice. To refuse what mean torture and death. But for most of those early Christians, their newly found life in Christ meant everything to them. So that they didn't hesitate to die a brutal death. Rather, they felt honored to suffer for Christ. The same attitude as Paul expresses in his letter to the saints in Colossae. That's Colossians 1, 24 and 25. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. But what about us? We don't experience massive persecution right now. But there are all kinds of smaller persecutions of believers in our days as well. Do you rejoice if somebody calls you a fool because you believe the Bible is God's word and true in, in every detail? Are you even brave enough to say no words uh, and uh, say no to words and actions your friends do that contradicts God's will. <coughs> we also, as empowered believers, can experience the joy of persecution and suffering for Christ. We not only proclaim to be a fan of Jesus Christ, but a true follower of Him, then suffering for Christ will cause you to rejoice. It is our calling to make the word of God fully known. We must stick to it. If you ex uh, experience persecution next time, may it be big or small, think about the early Christians in Rome and how they stuck to their belief, <coughs> no, mat no matter the cost. Amen. 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 So where is the picture right now? Will that be the fastest way? Yeah, just to that, this exit here. Sure, let's. You know, I meant this direction. Yeah, and then down. And then down.
when you go into the mountain road. Uh, this is from obviously the first century AD, and it was interesting to hear Martin share about the, the Jews being uh, taken to build the Colosseum, 100,000 Jews. That was something I learned that wasn't something I was going to share with you, but it goes hand in hand because it was around the same year that this was built as the Colosseum, 81 AD, 81, 82 AD by uh, Emperor Domitian, it's called the word apo apotheosis of Titus at the center. The sculpture program also includes two panel reliefs lining the passageway within the arch. Both co commemorate the joint triumph celebrated by Titus and his father Vespasian in the summer of 71. That's not 1971, that's 71 AD. Thank you. The south panel, which we, you, you, we'll need to look at when we go on the other side, depicts the spoils taken from the temple in Jerusalem. What are some of those things? The golden candelabrium, which are the golden candles, or menorah. The main focus is in carved in deep relief. Other sacred objects lead us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, Christ in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, those sent from God. So as Christians, we are chained to Christ and we have the victory in Him, just as you can picture not only coming through the arch, but the procession would go all through the streets of Rome saying that they've conquered certain lands and, and taken their loot and taken the things that they've, they've conquered. Uh, we've been conquered by Christ and we belong to Him as His property. There's a lot of things I could say about the arch. One inscription uh, that is here on the other side, way above, it says, Senatus Populuscus Romanus Divo Tito Divi Vespiani Filo. Vespiano Agosto, which means the Roman Senate and people. If you see SPQR around Rome, the Roman Senate and people dedicate this to the divine Titus. They made Titus a god. They made him a Roman god, son of the divine Vespasian. I didn't know I was going to go at this time, but I'm sure everything is connected here today, just with the Colosseum, the Arch of Titus, and whatever next truth nuggets come it's all connected because it's all part of the history we live and I thank you for your time and listening to me I hope you understood it in your language thank you very much <laughs> I would like to see this time. He wants a lot of things. Well, I mean, on the top, by the green. Yeah. Wow. Ich spreche Deutsch. 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 I'm gonna have to yell like yes. people did in the old times. Yes. <laughs> so, um, my truth nugget is about the is about the Via Sacra or the Sacred Road. This was the main road and the, it was the main street of ancient Rome, and it is part of the traditional route of the Roman Triumph. Just like the Champs Elysees in Paris, or just like the, I don't know if anybody's been in Berlin, but there's a big street called uh, the Street of uh, 17th of June, 
which connects uh, the whole city. So in the ancient times, this was one of the main roads, and it connected the Capitoline Hill, which is where you can see the white building with the statues on the top. That, there was no building back then, it was just a hill. And it connected that area all the way to... Oh, sorry. It connected that area all the way down to the Colosseum. Um, wait, technology? Through the arch. So, yeah. This busy street began on the outside of the city and it continued, as I said, to the Capitoline Hill and proceeded through, mo one of the most, through most of the important religious sites in, in that era, which were the temp two temples, which is one right here, the Temple of Romulus. You remember the story about the foundation of Rome, Romulus and Re uh, Romeo, which what were the twins? And the wolf mother. Yeah, and the wolf mother. And um, there's also uh, another temple right here. And uh, there was uh, a big church constructed in, in here in the middle. Um, it was one of the, 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 the this Via Sacra uh, contained myths as well as pagan temples government buildings and also uh, it was uh, the place where people made their trades and where they bought and sold things that they brought from other ancient lands because as you remember the roman empire was uh, very well widespread in that time during nero's reign the uh, there was a water canal in the middle going uh, uh, like a, a ceiling on top of the road and it brought water from the outside of the city into the Colosseum so that uh, in the Colosseum in the lower area it could be flooded and there could be naval battles. Um, the Via Sacra was also the way that the Romans used when they, whenever they won a battle or they won a war then they made a military parade and they paraded all the way through the road uh, onto the Colosseum where the, the celebrations were held. So, well, when we're walking down this path, um, we can only imagine how it must have been in the ancient times. We would have to imagine tall buildings on the sides, very uh, interesting architecture, but as well we would have to imagine a lot of people talking and screaming and selling things and declaring but we also would have to imagine the politicians being in their buildings as well as the priests being in their temples. The road provided many setting for uh, a setting for many deeds and misdeeds of Rome's history, solemn religious festivals, magnificent triumphs of victorious generals who came from the outside as well as uh, gambling as well as chatting and the daily life of the people but what does it have to do for us Christians what it might be the significance of this road well we know that uh, Paul when he came back to Rome he probably must have gone through this uh, street in order to go to the to the Caesar but how it, did it come to be that Paul came back to Rome well in Acts 25 we can read that while Paul was in Jerusalem, he was acu falsely accused of committing many crimes against Christianity, or what they considered Christianity back then. Um, and um, so these were the chief priests and some Jewish leaders. Um, one of the leaders, which was Portius Festus, um, he was newly appointed, and he was the one who was going to uh, take the trial of Paul. But Paul, being a Roman citizen, knew his rights, and he appealed to appear before Caesar in order to have his trial. So he had to travel from Jerusalem three months long or even more uh, on his way to, uh, to Rome. In the end, as we know, he was imprisoned, and he stayed here for um, two years. Um, and there is something that I really love about the way that the book of Acts ends, and especially in the NIV version. And it's in chapter 28, verses 30 to 31. And it says, For two years Paul stayed there, and he, in his own rented house, and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, and taught about Lord Jesus Christ, with all boldness and without hindrance. Just imagine how Paul was empowered in those moments, even when he knew he was going to face trial, even though he was 
falsely imprisoned, he was still preaching the gospel. He was still within the prison, within this house in which he was held. He was still welcoming people and teaching about um, our Lord Jesus. There are many verses that are that um, in many chapters, which uh, uh, books which Paul wrote during this imprisonment, uh, among others, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon. Is that right in English, Philemon? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and there are many verses which talk about how he uh, he is feeling the power of God, and he is also delivering this power to the people that he came in contact with. So, to end, um, whenever you might feel like the road is closing up ahead on you, just imagine, Paul came here, he walked this road, and he walked into a prison, and still he felt the power of God in the middle of that darkness. We are free. We live in a world where we can talk to other people, where we can share with other people about our gospel, about our Lord. So if Paul did it while being in a prison, how much more blessed are we that we can roam around, we can talk to the people, and we can just tell them, hey, the Lord Jesus loves you. Però ogni tanto si sente da fare, viene ma non è molto fedele. Ah, <laughs> Yes. Termine. No, no, io non so niente. Quale McDonald's? Che cos'è? Niente. 
Ma non fai niente, ti devi raccogliere di nuovo. No, non ti ho fatto. Ok, can you all gather? Ma non ti ho fatto niente. Come here. Can you speak slowly? Stop, we're going to do that. Ella. Ella, Dominic. Nice to meet you. I hate to not meet you and meet, or meet everyone in such a small conference, you know? <laughs> Natasha? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Natasha. And your friend. Dominic. Right now we are in the uh, Roman Forum, and what you can see behind me is the Rostra, and on the right is the Umbilicum Urbis. Umbilicus Urbis. What was a rostra? A rostra was a big platform. Uh, politicians, lawyers, famous speakers from the past used this platform to speak. What did they speak about? Uh, well, the platform was used as a court, as a tribunal, and politicians tried to convince, for example, the Senate to pass a bill. By so doing, they would influence the city of Rome. Not only that, they would influence the rest of the world. In fact, the city of Rome was the center of the most powerful empire of the ancient world. Therefore, Rome could be considered the center of the ancient world, the center of the world things discussed here would affect the rest of the world. The Romans knew that their city was the center of the world. They even had a symbolic place that was the umbilicus urbis, right there. That means the navel of the city. Umbilicus means navel. That uh, umbilicus urbis, which we can see the remnant of it, was, it represented the geographical center of the city. It was the geographical center of the city. What does that mean? It was considered a reference point, a standard uh, to measure distances. For example, they said, this city is 20 miles from Rome, and they meant 20 miles or 30 miles from that spot, Umbilicus Orbis. Is there something like that today? For example, we can think of Greenwich, the prime meridian. It's a standard for distances. For example, we're now on the 12th meridian east of Greenwich. So we have a standard to measure distances, right? But it seems like today people don't have a, a standard, to a final standard to measure what is right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. There is no umbilicus orbis for what's right and what's wrong. For example, when I was in university, I remember a professor telling me, oh, you know, there is no right or wrong. It all depends on circumstances. It, it all depends uh, on your upbringing, on your culture. There's no absolute truth. There's no absolute standard. Well, I asked her a question. I said, what if I come and kill your child? <coughs> Would it be right or wrong? And she said, well, it would be wrong because in our culture it's wrong, but it's not universally wrong. She said, for example, in Sparta, they used to kill children that were not fit for battle. And I said, yeah, they did that, but we need to say that that was wrong. We shouldn't be afraid to say that that was wrong. But you see, without a standard for right or wrong, we're lost. We look everywhere for a standard of right or wrong until we find Jesus. He said, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's in John 14, 6. There is the truth. He is the truth. There is a standard. Jesus is a standard. God is the ultimate standard of truth. Jesus is truth. He's the only way to God. And He gives us life. And then Jesus prayed, sanctify them in the truth. He asked God to sanctify the believers in the truth. <coughs> what is the truth? And Jesus answered, your word is the truth. If we want to be empowered, we need to know what our umbilicus orbis is. What is our standard of truth? Jesus and His Word are our standard of truth. This is our umbilicus orbis with which we evaluate our lives and we evaluate the events happening around us. And as we see the rostra behind me, as I told you, the speaking platform, speaker's platform, we may think you know, I am not a politician. I am not a lawyer. I cannot speak well. I won't be able to influence people. And that's right. We can. In our own strength, we can do nothing. But, if we abide in His Word, and His Word abides in us, we will be able to use the rostra in our lives. What is the rostra in our lives? Opportunities to speak God's truth to others. Whether it is to encourage a brother or a sister, or to speak before a nation. My prayer and my desire, as we look at these landmarks, at these buildings, is that we can see this happen all the more in our lives as we keep Jesus and His Word as our standard of truth, as our umbilicus urbis, and we can point people to Him. Thank you. I know. History from the persecution and a little bit of life of Paul. This is the end of the road. You just sing, uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. You know who wrote that song? An Indian man that was ready to be beheaded for his faith. Now behind me, it's, a, it's our last true target. But before I go there, I ask you, what if I told you, what if I tell you that tonight you're not going back to the hotel? That uh, somebody's going to come here and take you to a small little hole behind our bed. And uh, I want to give a last farewell to all of you, God's servants. <coughs> Behind my my shoulder, there is the, the prison, the prison of the apostles here at home. They say that uh, in this, uh, underneath this church, there is a uh, a little room with a hole, and underneath the hole, a dark little small room. And they say that uh, the Apostle Paul was in chain here, imprisoned in the dark. And, uh, and uh, you, can, you can pass, I don't think we will be able to see it, it looks like there's, they're doing some restoration. But you go there into this lowest uh, level of the ground, it's very uh, low into the ground, and a uh, few square meters. It's where Paul stayed. There is a column, and Paul was in chain with this column. And there's also a little sprinkle of water. 
Now, we don't know that's for sure, but Paul was preaching to the prisoners. And some of them came to Christ. And so he baptized them through this water. And uh, there's no light. And he was about to be executed. This was the end of the road. Because Nero, at the time Nero, he didn't want it to release him. Peter, later on, was going to be crucified upside down to the Vatican Hill, not far from here. Paul, on the south part of Rome, beheaded, where there is today a church, uh, St. Paul, uh, outside the wall. He was beheaded outside of the, the wall on the Ostian Way that leads to the sea. So, Paul, in these circumstances, in this dark hole that is underneath the ground, right there. He, he, he see those circumstances as a benefit for the advancement of the gospel. People have heard of his arrest. They, the believers around Rome and uh, uh, other parts of, uh, of the Christian world were encouraged by his boldness and they were more ready to share their faith. And people even in the prison came to know Christ through his chain. And even if uh, he was abandoned by some of his friends, somebody left him, betrayed him, uh, almost he didn't have anything left. He was beaten and close to be beheaded. And I want to read to you his last words. It's from uh, the second letter to Timothy. In chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. This is uh, the la last letter that Paul wrote before being beheaded. Perhaps here. And he says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, we are in 67 AD, and Paul has been in prison, Andrea said before, and also the other uh, Truth Nugget said, he was in prison and he had a little bit of freedom. This time, it's in prison because he's a criminal. It's a serious matter. He, he really, uh, at this point, even Christians felt, I'm not going there, Paul. I'm sorry, this is too much. And uh, he, he died in 68 AD, in the spring of 68 AD. So this is really his last months. And he wants to to write this letter to Timothy and say, Timothy, look at my present circumstances. He says, I am being poured out. This is the end. This is the end of my life. And uh, in another letter in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul says, he talks about being poured out and he says, even if I will be poured out. But in this time he's saying, I have already been poured out. So he's 100% sure that they will cut his head off. And, and it's like a drink offering. What is this drink offering that Paul is talking about? In the Old Testament, when the sacrifice was made, at the end of every sacrifice you put the wine, the drink offering, as a, an offer of your life. And Paul is doing this. Christ did it in his last supper. And the blood of the people at the Colosseum is the blood of the martyr. And I remember in Lord of the Rings there is this scene, the second uh, movie, where the king is at the helm hole and he's ready to lose the battle. Every There's no chance that, that you're gonna win. And yet he takes his sword and he go out for his last fight to die with glory. And that's kind of the attitude that Paul has here. And Timothy must take courage and what, what he's doing, Paul, he's reviewing his past life. He's a soldier. He fought the good fight. He's 
not afraid of death. Think about all the atheists, they go to death. And they're so scared. He's not desperate. He's dead, he's satisfied. I have done what I needed to do. Mission accomplished. And uh, he fought the good fight of faith. The faith that overcomes the world. Not only this, but he's also an athlete. And run the race. And he finished that race. He's not just somebody that start the race, but he finished. He completed. And it's the race of the gospel of Christ. And the salvation that there is if you put the trust in Christ Jesus. A, there's a lot of starter in a race, but few people finish the race. And also he's like a custodian. He kept the faith. He's like a steward that kept his charge. In the way he walked his life and in the doctrine he preached, ready even to death. He's not talking about successful ministry. Look at him in this big hole. No, he's rejoicing because he has been faithful even under failure and is passing the baton to us, to us, to the future generations of God's servants. And then at the end, verse 8, is says, looking at the future. He's not concerned about the present. He says, because of those things, he's sure to receive the crown of righteousness. This is the end of the race as we walk all the way from the Colosseum. And uh, he's waiting for a crown <coughs> because he, he persevered, he lived a disciplined life, he shared the gospel of salvation, he discipled people, he endured all sort of trials that we can't even compare ourselves, and he has shepherded the flock of God. And so you can hear God says, well done now, Paul. He's not afraid to appear before Jesus, the righteous judge, on the day of judgment. So, think about this, when the circumstances of your life are not as easy. Think of Paul. It was much, far worse than yours. And yet, he's saying, not just me. I'm not the only one taking a stand now. There's a lot of people. A lot of people that are loving his appearing. Agapao is the word here, are longing for the appearing of Christ, His second coming, Epiphania, the manifestation. And so the question is, are we waiting the coming of Christ? Eagerly waiting, something you love and desire? Or are we hoping, putting our hope on things of this world? So, I may not see you again, guys. What if uh, ISIS take over Europe and we, we have to face something similar that Paul is facing? They're no different than the Roman soldiers that led him outside of Rome and they cut his head off. What are you doing with your faith? What have you been your priorities in life? Can you look back to your life without regret? I wish I've done more. Unfinished, uh, unfinished plan that we have, how many of those? But when you feel like quitting, when everything is going bad, don't give up. Don't be demoralized because you're not the only one. And no matter how difficult it may look, it is worth living for and it's worth even dying for. So uh, when we, we, we leave this place now, I want you to remember that you now have the freedom that Paul didn't have. And you have the same power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. What would you do differently if you were in those circumstances? How to use your talents wisely? Because Paul, look at this present circumstance, he looks behind to his past life and then to the future glory. And he finished saying, I finished the race. <coughs> so I want to challenge you. Let's examine our race before we leave this place. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We have decided.
Stop.